Well, Josh Jacobs played quite a bit in the Hall of Fame game and, to be honest, looked pretty well. But is that a negative sign for his dynasty outlook going forward with the Las Vegas Raiders? That and more today on the Dynasty Newsletter. I'm your host, Adam Wildy, joined by my co-host, Chris Allen. Chris, is Josh Jacobs on his way out of Vegas, or was this not a big deal? I mean, if you were already just look, reading the tea leaves, not getting the contract extension, and then all and this on top of that, the team drafted Zamir White, who to me looks almost like a Josh Jacobs clone, at least in the way that he played like last Thursday. It was just more of a confirmation bias thing. It's almost like the same thing we were talking about last week. Any sign, I mean, any you talk to any fantasy drafter, whether it was Redraft, whether it was Best Ball, whether it was Dynasty, we were all kind of playing off the same sheet of music when it comes to Josh Jacobs. Just looking at the non-contract extension, the fact that they retain Kenyon Drake, they bring in Zamir White. This coaching staff with the changeover have no ties to Josh Jacobs. So, yeah, his stock was already plummeting. And then... Yeah, I'm not going to try and read like too much into the, him playing well into the Thursday night game. I mean, of course, if he had gotten injured, that would have been a whole different story as yeah. to why he'd been there in the first place. Blah, 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 blah. Of an issue. Yeah, but I mean, this is also a team with, like I just mentioned, a new coaching staff. They probably do want to see, even though it's not with the starters because we didn't see Derek Carr out there, didn't see Devontae Adams, Hunter Renfro, any of those guys. But just seeing how that uh, that that running back group can work in tandem. Heck, we were even seeing some usage for Amir Abdullah, not just like overall touches, but like third down touches. So yeah. trying to see like what that RB carousel is going to look like, especially given like where Josh McDaniels comes from and the amount of ripping our hair out that we had to do with the Patriots running back crew. It does make some sense, like in that vein, that we would see some sort of heavy rotation and also heavy usage just to see what it would look like looking at their individual skill sets. Josh Jacobs as the one, two down banger, throw in Amir Abdullah as a possible pass catcher. Kenyon Drake can move in there as well. And then, of course, we saw Zamir White in short yardage. I mean, all of those things, like it makes sense if you squint and look at it. But like I said beforehand, we were probably already looking for confirming our priors regarding Josh Jacobs. And the fact that they don't have any ties to him, the fact that they didn't extend him, the fact that they're probably looking for other stuff, even though literally out today, they're talking to uh, Josh McDaniels came out to squash like any of that uh, type of discussion regarding him, them trying to trade or trade him away or anything like that. So it doesn't matter. We already had our minds made up about where Josh Jacobs is going to be at after this season. Thursday night really doesn't change any of that for me to be quite, to be quite honest. So I thought about changing the thumbnail after we uh, got that that conversation from Josh McDaniel earlier. And uh, after I thought about it really hard and I was like, nah, I don't buy it. I mean, that was a lot of it was a lot of coach speak. That was coach speak 101, actually, if I'm being honest. I mean, you don't have to be a film guy to see the few, first few touches from Josh Jacobs and think, get that guy off the field. Absolutely mm -hmm. no reason for Josh Jacobs be, to be there. And this this has brought up a healthy conversation in the community because people have forgotten that Josh Jacobs is very good at football. Um, quality running back was a great, great, great prospect coming out of Alabama. He didn't have the the workhorse um, role in Alabama because it's tough to get that with um, Najee Harris behind you and guys like that. So um, he, there were there were questions about, well, how's he going to hold up with full workload? Okay, well, came in his rookie season, did pretty well, and then he's mm -hmm. been banged up a lot throughout his career. Last year, played banged up the whole year and caught what was it, fifty four passes, uh, banged up the whole year. So who knows what he can do going forward? That being said, you hit all the points that everybody said in, in terms of it's a new regime. Josh McDaniels is going to play multiple running backs on a consistent basis. I guess the point to be had there is just that Josh Jacobs looked head and shoulders over the other running backs. Amir White looked solid, especially in his first appearance as NFL player. Still somebody on the dynasty radar. But Zamir White didn't look nearly as polished as Josh Jacobs. Um, I tried to pay especially close attention once I noticed – well. I had too much skin in the game with showdown, first of all, so paid way too much attention to that game. But secondly, once I noticed how much run Josh Jacobs was getting, bam, first thought was, okay, well, I guess Josh Jacobs is just one of the cavalry. 
So then I wanted mm-hmm. to pay more attention to Zamir White because next thing that clicked in my head, well, if Josh Jacobs, if they're willing to give him this much run in the Hall of Fame game, then that must mean that they're really, really pumped about Zamir White. Otherwise, you can't – then the, they would have to ba- basically think that Josh Jacobs is expendable is where my mind went. Kenyon Drake did not look good. He's coming back from injury. Did not look good. Amir Abdullah actually looked really good, like – better than he has in a long time and then zamir white got a whole whole bunch of touches um just looked fine i mean he looked good for a fourth round back right so i mean sure he was a decent investment for them especially if they want the like the Ramondre stevenson damon harris james white kind of situation going on but yeah at the end of the day when when it all came full circle i came away with josh jacobs is not expendable at all he was clearly head and shoulders better than the other backs. And he's playing against the the Jaguars starting defense, right? We got Zamir White against third stringers. Zamir White played so long that I went to sleep because I thought I was dead. And <laughs> and he's playing into the fourth quarter, right? So we, we got Zamir White against some real, like, used car salesmen. And Josh Jacobs was just looking like midseason form on very few touches, okay? Very few touches. Uh, against starting defense and improved starting defense, might I add. So the only problem is that in Dynasty, if you, people have been listening to me for years, I do not like when running backs change teams, especially high-profile running backs like Josh Jacobs, who were first-rounders. It just never works out. You get less of a workload with the next team. It means you're probably getting closer to your age, Cliff. Um, mm-hmm. And if you don't work out right away with that team, you don't get two years a year like other positions do. I mean, if you don't work out with your new team, you're probably going to see a decreased role or you're going to move to a third team very quickly. So Josh Jacobs not getting his fifth year option is kind of a big deal. You would like to think that he's earning his way back on the Raiders because they could get, they could sign him for cheaper next year than the fifth year option would have been. But if they already think he's expendable, then that kind of nicks that and now we're in this weird thing in dynasty where it's like if you have josh jacobs on your roster you're happy you have a really good player you're sad because the team apparently doesn't see him as a really good player he doesn't have like a huge uptick in 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 um production coming his way in the coming years so it seems like josh jacobs is just even though he's so young, he's almost seeming like that Derrick Henry that you're just going to have to ride with for his whole career. There's never going to be like a, a peak selling point that I can see in his future right now. No, and I, to be quite honest, is there is there a window actually? Well, not a window, but I think there's a there's a buying opportunity here. To to be quite honest, if we're sure. if we're already in agreement that he's going to have, let's say, at least the Majority workload. A majority workload could be like 50.1% of the running back touches for the Raiders this season. Mm-hmm. And then without, let's say, a cut into his like short yardage, like goal line work, because we saw Zamir White like being used in that fashion on Thursday. Obviously, like his, or not obviously, but I would say that it's likeliest that his pass catching work, limited as it already was, gets cut into by either of Kenyon Drake and Amir Abdullah. Okay, fine. But again, if we're going to be getting a guy that's getting get, still going to get significant touches like on his squad at a reduced cost, most folks would say you would try and acquire that asset like for, let's say, a at a reduced cost, like I was just mentioning. Mm-hmm. And also, like you mentioned, but like you were talking about beforehand, what's his future outlook going to be? So let's say the Raiders do move on from him. I don't know. Josh Jacobs, future Atlanta Falcon. Yeah, that's the tough thing. You never know with running backs because teams tend to add running backs. It's like people just come out of the woodwork. Like, um, I don't know. I th- I think he could be like Javante Williams 1B next year, something like that. Could, could still be fine, but not the value likely, you wish I guess, he since had it's right the same now. Division, though. Well, he's going to be a free agent. He might want to stay in the same division after they declined his fifth year option and sent him back in. But well, they I, could. yeah, that's true. Yeah, he's going to be a free agent for sure. And I don't know that if anything. Now, if we take this step back and just let's look at this thing logically, look at these guys as people, right? If anything, the Raiders should be trying out for Josh Jacobs, in my opinion. 
running back is a tough position to really like wrap your head around because of its mm. importance and maybe lack thereof. However, Josh Jacobs is a very quality running back. He's had a little bit of injury bug, and maybe the new regime wants to start fresh, which is why they grabbed Zamir White when when he slid in the draft. Mm -hmm. But I think that the Raiders should be, you know, should have sat Josh Jacobs for starters. For one, even if you don't like him that much, very good running back, been injured a lot. Why would you play him in the Hall of Fame game? Okay, so that's one. Um, If you're sending him a message, what's the message? You already declined his fifth-year option. He gets it, dude. Guy gets it. <laughs> you don't mm-hmm. like you don't value him enough. So, in my opinion, the Raiders should should be doing things differently to try to keep Josh Jacobs around at that reduced price. He, declining his fifth year option was smart business, in my opinion. Why would you ever? First off, why are you taking a running back in the first round, anyways? But then, secondly, decline his fifth year option if he likes the team and you like him. You're going to agree on something less than first round tenure on five years. So. Mm-hmm. Why would you ever take the fifth round option on a running back unless you are in a situation where that running back doesn't want to stay with you? And then maybe you get a fifth year and a franchise out of it. But that was fine. Everything was kosher until Josh Jacobs started, not just started. If he took one, if he took one series, like fine. Um, then I would have bought the coach speak where it was like, oh, we just think our running backs need to get hit. Well, that's dumb for one. For two, okay. So if you took one series, fine. But like Josh Jacobs keeps coming back, keeps coming back. And trust me, I'm playing showdown. I'm watching. I'm I want those starters out. Get them out. Because mm-hmm. I don't want no Chase Claypool um like hundred yards and four catches and then he's out of there. So I want Josh Jacobs out and he just keeps on coming, right? So I don't really understand how this benefits anybody except for makes us have to wrap our heads around what Josh Jacobs next three years looks like. And so you're to your point about him being a buy. He could, he could definitely be a buy because there's this negative conversation around him, Like I'm having right now. Mm -hmm. Um, But he's a buy with the caveat that he's probably going to help you win games this year, maybe help you win games next year, but his value will never be higher than it is now. And it should be higher than it is now. Um, his ADP should be higher because he's a very good running back. He's on an improved offense, but it's not going to go up. So you trade for him now. You hope to get RB2 numbers with with RB1 games sometimes. Um, right. And you hope you win a championship with him, and then you just ride into the sunset with him like you're doing with Derrick Henry right now. Pretty much. And if you're able to acquire him, so let's say you acquire him for – um, throwing it out there, let's say like a future second or something like that. Yeah, I was thinking. I mean, it's going to have to be like a second in like Ty Davis Price or like a yeah. It's going to be a, a an early second and like a throw in running back because people are going to say, "Well, I need a prospect running back if I'm going to get younger." So it's probably going to be your Ty Davis Price, maybe even Zamir White, a second in Zamir White, maybe. <laughs> could be and i was thinking something on the lines of well i mean a second already allows the person acquiring him to get a little bit younger and then maybe i don't know you throw in like a khalil herbert type somewhere along those lines like where it's like a sure. little bit more like ambiguous but at least mm-hmm. like the youth is still there but either way if we're talking about a running back that we can both agree would probably fall into the 1b ish range like on their second team like once he if mm-hmm. he winds up moving away from from the raiders that's still a pretty decent amount of touches like right there so if you're able to acquire him at that cost it's not the worst you know what a good situation or a good scenario to compare him to if you want to talk about now this was a lot different because kareem hunt got himself in trouble mm-hmm. but there is a top end outcome where uh, Josh Jacobs is still able to be a 1B somewhere and still produce a, a, a la Kareem Hunt the last few years because I do believe Josh Jacobs is close to that talent. Kareem Hunt, more talented than Josh Jacobs in my mind. Um, Kareem Hunt's probably like a pure talent, like nothing else. Top seven, top eight running back in the league. So it's not like I'm you know, downing Josh Jacobs to say he's not quite as good as Kareem Hunt. But sure. um he could have that career that career arc like Melvin Gordon and Kareem Hunt. It's just that it doesn't happen that often. But the guys I'm thinking about are like the Kenyon Drakes, the Jarek McKinnon, like guys that probably shouldn't have been considered in that vein anyways. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe Josh Jacobs is 
good enough to where he goes to a second team. And then you look really smart for acquiring him right now, especially the, the trades we were just throwing out probably could get done. And I would not trade Josh Jacobs for anything close to that. Like if, for me to trade Josh Jacobs, I'm like, let's talk about this for a second. You probably should be giving me a first if, mm-hmm. if you know, all things considered, but you're not going to yeah. give me that. So I'm probably going to get, I'm going to want like a second in like Alec Pierce or something like that. And nobody's going to give me that. So um, Josh Jacobs wouldn't even be leaving my team. Um, so maybe it is, maybe it is by situation for Josh Jacobs and slight, slight chance that he increases in value. If he doesn't, then you're going to have a guy that uh, is going to get RB2 numbers with, uh, for the next few years. Mm-hmm. So that's going to bring us into our next conversation about a rising star after we started out a little bit negative in Romeo Dubes. And that is the wide receiver drafted in the fourth round to the Green Bay Packers, looking like apparently the wide receiver won in camp. Um, Christian Watson hurt right now. Uh, mm-hmm. That was their high draft pick. Sammy Watkins is getting a lot of work with the ones. like They're not even thinking about Sammy Watkins not being a starter, which is mind boggling to me. But so Sammy Watkins and Romeo Dubes are getting the work with the ones and uh, Aaron Rodgers can't stop praising. So what do you think about Romeo? And I mean, you're late. You're late to the party right now. We were talking about it before. We were trying to remember where he was drafted. I think he landed around 308, 309. Um, Obviously, that's changed now, as I've seen on Twitter. Somebody traded Christian Watson for Romeo Dubes straight up. Um, so what do you do now? I mean, are you trying to jump on the bandwagon still? No, no, I'm not trying to jump on that bandwagon because we already know, and this is complete, like, let's roll down narrative street because we know how much of the, like, how much of a requirement it is to be in like the trust circle of Aaron Rodgers. So it's all good and fun when it's in training camp, when it's against air, just now getting into padded practices and all that. What happens when Dubes drops that first touchdown pass, like in an actual game when it matters, how quickly Adams crew started, like like how quickly (laughs) is Aaron Rodgers going to be like, well, just give me the next guy. Like how quickly is the team just going to try and revert to Christian Watson, whom we've all just kind of thrown into the dust. Or, shoot, what happens when they try and turn to this Samari Torre, seventh rounder, sixth, seventh rounder, Mm -hmm. that Aaron Rodgers has also talked about as well? So I think it's fine if if you drafted dudes like at cost, like in your rookie drafts, like we were saying, mid to late, like third rounder somewhere in there. If you got them, cool. Absolutely. I mean, hats off to you for making that leap because I think both of us at the time were just kind of like, okay, fine. Mm -hmm. Fourth round wide receiver, very low hit rate. Right, exactly. I mean, especially given this wide receiver class, you kind of have to take the guys that were drafted later with a grain of salt because everybody got pulled up since mm-hmm. so many wide receivers were drafted. So I'm not trying to jump on that train as of right now, especially if the cost in order to acquire dupes is so much so that you have to trade a guy that was an <laughs> early second rounder in order to pick first. a guy that was a late <laughs> third rounder. So no, I, I ain't jumping on that train. The actionable part for me though, would be just to try and scoop up the volume vacuum that comes like if we're already hyping up dudes. So sure. I will try and stash Tory like on my practice squad, just given the temperament of the quarterback that they're attached to. Cause once the bullets start flying, shoot, we've seen like Aaron Rodgers has no allegiances to essentially anybody outside of Devonte Adams, who is one of the best receivers in the game. And dudes ain't that Christian watching ain't that Sammy Watkins for sure. Isn't that, so we could, I mean, look at, look at all the other guys that have kind of like tossed the side. Like he doesn't even talk to Jordy Nelson anymore. Jeff Janis became a, just a complete nobody afterwards, after the great things that we saw him do in his limited stance. So, I mean, there's no, there, there's nothing concrete. There's no contract stipulation that says that dudes has to be the guy, like once the bullets start flying or once those passes actually count for something on our rosters or in our lineups. So if, I'm already seeing everybody shift towards dudes. Who else could possibly be available in order for me to pick up and stash on my roster? As of this point, it's Torre. So I'll just go and grab him if I can. This is a, a beautiful uh, and a thought exercise for us. And, and for anyone who's been listening to us for a long time, I'm just going to, since I agree with everything you say, I'm just going to play devil's advocate for everything that I can hear people screaming in my ear right now. One of them is, Adam, you always talk about paying for information. Well, you paid for information for Romeo Dubes. 
What information did you get? Christian Watson is hurt. Romeo Dubes is practicing well. Who else is out there? Sammy Watkins has zero chance of not being a, a, a wide receiver one on that team. What does that tell you? <laughs> that right. tells you that they are desperate for wide receiver production. So, yes, I do believe that it's okay to jump on bandwagons late if you're paying for information. If you found out that, uh, let's say um, you found out that um, – James Robinson was going to be out for the year. And so Travis Etienne was going to be stepping into a larger role and he probably not going to give the reins back to James Robinson. We'll say it worked out that way. Okay. Then you're going to pay more for Travis Etienne in that made up scenario, but that doesn't mean that it was bad to trade for him because you bought information. You bought the information that he is now the bona fide starting running back. You got nothing out of the, First few weeks of training camp, except for, wow, Romeo Dubes is surprising people. Okay, that's cool. fine. I would rather, I, w- I would argue, now it's usually earlier to be early, on, usually better to be early on people. The problem is that you're paying the, you're paying a price right now as if you actually saw something. You haven't mm-hmm. seen anything to pay for yet. So if it was like week three and it's like, okay, Romeo Dubes is that guy. He's clearly Aaron Rodgers' favorite wide receiver. I'm just going to have to pay extra then. I'm going to have to look at it and say, but do I see more of a ceiling? And if I see more of a ceiling or if there's something that indicates that there's more of a ceiling there, I'll pay more, but I'm not going to pay all this. I mean, you're talking about uh, like a 112 to 202 value on Romeo Dubes after like three weeks into the NFL season training camp. I put him on the trading block immediately if that's the case. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I saw, like I said, some, I I wish I remember who it was. I could give them credit, but somebody having the conversation between the Christian Watson and Romeo Dubes. I mean, that's just like, that's a problem. You need Christian, you need to trade for Christian Watson. If you have Romeo Dubes, like 100% that we, I feel like you do this every single, the, the wide range, you, not you do this every year where, you get really excited about uh, training camp because there hasn't been football so long. It's mm-hmm. almost like we need the uh, what was the movie where he got the tattoos all over himself? Oh, it Memento, uh, I think. Memento, yeah. It's, it's almost like Memento, where we need to say, "Hey, don't don't, don't increase rookies' values yeah. just because of training camp." Um, so if you get more information and things end up working out differently then you will have to pay a little bit extra it's just that Romeo Dubes all he's shown so far is that he's pretty good at football yeah, yeah of course I mean I would hope the, so he's in the NFL he was a fourth round pick probably pretty good at football um I'm excited for him I think that he's going to do very well uh, I don't think that he's worth what he's going for right now so if I have Romeo Dubes probably a good chance to get a like a quick flip, even if, and you could probably get more than this to be honest with you, but even if you got a 23 second for him, um, I'm pin smash still, except you still did great. I, I don't think you need to smash except that you probably get more than a 23 second for, for Romeo Dubes right now. Yeah, you're right. If I need to make sure I didn't draft him anywhere because um, I'm going to go check if I could get a 23 second for him, I would be uh, very very excited so we've got another rookie to talk about in just a moment but first let me let you guys know that we're coming at you from the uh football guys newsletter that's brought to you straight to your inbox from joe bryant it is created by joe bryant cecil lammy and sigmund bloom they've got all the information from training camps gets you right to your email quick read it's even got little hyperlinks that clicks you through the article if there's something you want to read more than something else and that's where we get our information from so that we can take a dynasty approach to these conversations so make sure you go to footballguys.com, subscribe to the Football Guys newsletter. Our next conversation is going to be another rookie and Daniel Bellinger, someone who we haven't talked about much. And frankly, we haven't needed to talk about much. It wasn't a super deep uh, tight end draft class. However, um, it is something that we should bring to everyone's attention because if you're like me and hadn't really thought about it, Daniel Bellinger has been considered the bona fide tight end one for the New York Giants. Um, His value is basically zero right now. So to be able to grab a tight end, one that's clearly got upside from zero, um, it would be a great approach to go ahead and try to pick up Daniel Bellinger um, prior to the season. Uh, They've got Ricky Seals-Jones as well, but he's injured right now. Uh, I don't think it mattered. I'm pretty sure the 
the drum beats for Daniel Bellinger started prior to uh, the Ricky Seals Jones injury. So I'm pretty excited about Daniel Bellinger. I'm going to try to pick him up in a few places prior to uh, the season kicking off. So I don't know if you want to add anything on Daniel Bellinger because we've got another yeah. giant to get to. I mean, right? Because right. it's like, I, well, I I'm would not say that you he's good, but I am telling you he's worth nothing, and he's probably going to be worth you know something being a tight right. starting. Right. But I mean, it's it's definitely worth noting, and so this is one thing that I've tried to be a bit better about, and over the past like couple of seasons. And if anybody that doesn't follow him on Twitter. Uh, definitely go ahead and take a look at it. If not, just go mine his database. Uh, Kent Laplatte at MathBomb on Twitter. He He's the creator of the RAS, or Relative Athletic Scores. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I would say mm -hmm. that when it comes to tight end prospects, I mean, like wide receiver, quarterback, and all that, and the relative athletic scores, since wide receiver is such a massive range or like massive amount of like massive range of outcomes for each wide receiver, considering what they're asked to do. I mean, shoot, we've had this conversation before. Like, what did DeAndre Hopkins run? Like a 4-6? Cooper yeah, Cup right. also ran like a 4-6. So it's like pretty much irrelevant. Yeah, the, the relative athletic scores for wide receivers can differ. But for tight ends, that actually there actually is some signal. Go and mine his database and look at the relative athletic scores for the tight ends that have wound up actually being fantasy relevant. All high scores in terms of like where they score it. Like so, it's out of ten. Anything above like a seven is is decent. If you're getting into the eights and nines, you're legit. Daniel Bellinger has a nine point six six relative athletic Yeesh. score. I so that's actually pretty good for a tight end. I mean, four six three, like forty yard dash. I mean, his uh, his three cone time is actually pretty legit. So I mean, just walk it down. I mean, he even has listed the relative comps for Daniel Bellinger just based off his relative athletic score. The first three names for the a comparison for Daniel Bellinger at tight end: Travis Kelsey, Greg Olson, Dallas Goddard. Not bad. If you're thinking about it. So yeah. I get the fact that he's attached to Daniel Jones and just looking at the, uh, was it the pass or whatever I that's been like circulating on, on Twitter, like over the past like week I or so. And the Kenny it. Galladay may, I, I think I'm starting to join the Kenny Galladay made that look worse club, which I is tough I don't know. because I, I have the it, most exposure to Kenny Galladay ever. A, it's a throwaway cornerback had inside leverage and also B I think both things can be true at the same time like one it was a throwaway and two Kenny Galladay just pulled up because he knew I, it was a throwaway I thought you were gonna say one it was a throwaway and two Daniel Jones is bad no 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 I think just both things can be true and we just want only one of the things to be true whether it's Kenny Galladay being bad or cooked or Daniel Jones being bad I think in this case <laughs> both things are true and that Kenny Galladay pulled up and Daniel Jones threw the pass away. That's sure. just my take. But back to Daniel Bellinger. So if we do think that he, so Bellinger is athletic enough to run routes, then 100% worth a stash. I mean, if we're already looking at tight ends towards the back end of this draft, like Isaiah Likely, who I am drafting over Charlie Kolar, even though Kolar has the higher draft capital, yep. Likely has the higher RAS mm -hmm. score. So I would, one, go check your roster or go check your waiver wires for for likely. But um, that's that at least gives me some sense of hope that, again, looking at the way this roster shakes out, we don't know what the, we don't know what this pass catching nucleus is going to look like in the future. Sterling Shepard's got the Achilles injury. Darius Slayton yeah. is likely gone after this season. Mm -hmm. Kenny Galladay. We don't even know like with the how much he costs, the team could look to move on from him. So really, other than Kadarius Tony and Rondo Wando Robinson, who is really going to be like on this team for long term? Mm -hmm. Shoot, even the quarterback might not be there next season. We haven't even gotten Probably into that not. conversation. So it's like other than those two wide receivers, who else is going to be catching passes for this team? Like and Saquon might be gone pretty soon. Yeah. So it's like we've got those two guys that we know for certain in the two to three year window that most dynasty managers play that those two guys are definitely going to be there. Tony should be there unless he winds up getting to a fight again and gets kicked off the team. And then Wando Robinson on a rookie contract. So it's like those two guys for sure. And then Daniel Bellinger also on a rookie contract. He should be there. And so if we know that he's athletic, we know that he should be there, then he should be out there running routes.
which apparently is capable of doing. Also fairly decent as a blocker, at least from what we're reading throughout camp. So I'm in on Bellinger. And, and he's just free. I mean, yeah. even even at this point in the offseason when you and I mentioned him, people are going to be like, oh, yeah, I forgot about Daniel Bellinger. That's it. Yeah. They're going to forget about him again. Won't it's have like, any so. – I, I would not expect him to have any – sort of impact like this season there's already enough right. going on with the pass catchers they currently have there we've got at least four options like for daniel jones and we can't even expect daniel jones to carry two of them maybe <laughs> maybe two and a half maybe maybe so it's maybe. like if there are already four that there are like legitimate weapons like for for the giants I'm not going to try and hitch my wagon to like the fifth or sixth option like in in that offense regardless of well, what dayball is might be capable of doing yeah, it's probably going to be Daniel Jones's fault if they don't get if they can't spread it out enough. I would argue that Evan Ingram was a pretty big part of the offense. It's just that he was also his own worst enemy, um, whether it be nagging injuries, um, sure. drop drops or whatever. I mean, you're going to have a drop here and there. If they're consistent, though, then it starts to eat into your involvement in um, high leverage situations. So that's this is the argument I have with people who say that drops don't matter. Drops do not matter. However. It's not just the catch that you didn't catch that you lose the points for. It's future opportunity when you lose trust that it matters for. And Evan Ingram stood out um, a lot for his drops. Uh, oh, yeah. So Daniel Bellinger could have a little bit of a role, but it's also Brian Dabo now. So who knows how much they'll use the tight end. Either way, Daniel Bellinger is the perfect name for your taxi squad. And then when you go to look at your team next year, you're like, oh, wait, I have another starting tight end. Yeah. Now let's get to another New York Giants rookie and Wandell Robinson. This is really a tough one. So he's got the um he's got the draft capital that we want. Second round, um, eleven picks into the second round, I believe. However, he's only five eight, he's 178 pounds. He's been getting a lot of camp buzz. Um some people saying that he's been the best player at camp. <laughs> I mean, that's very high praise, especially when you have Kenny Galladay with one of the largest wide receiver contracts, certainly top fifteen. You've got Saquon Barkley coming back from injury. He should be lighting up training camp. So to say that Wondell Robinson at his size, his stature, is the star of uh, their training camp, that's that's high praise. And because of his size, even though he had the draft capital, his value is probably not fair currently. And in the mm -hmm. draft, it probably wasn't fair. In the draft, he was probably, I'd say, getting to 210 in Superflex, 209, 210. Mm -hmm. um, so like we talked about with dudes, we can't do the double-edged sword like Wondell Robinson's not climbing the ranks either. He's still got, what, Mount Everest to climb, essentially, for a prospect to hit at his size. Um, but that being said, I mean, what are you doing with Wondell Robinson and Dynasty uh, after he's been lighting it up all offseason? I mean, if somebody comes a call and asks for Wondell Robinson, I'm sure I'll, I'll listen to any offer. Yeah, so pretty much to... same thing, copy and paste. Yeah, yeah but I think, but of course the, but the huge caveat is, well, I mean, honestly, it's not even a huge caveat, but it's just, what's the, what's the path to touches now? Like we just laid out, I mean, for dubs, it's so much easier because you do have a somewhat nebulous pass catcher core, like for Green Bay. Yeah. With, and the best I mean, quarterback ever throwing the ball. So yeah. And that's that the helped. other part too. I mean, but if you look at, if you look at the pecking order in green Bay, like who's their wide receiver one, it shoot by week 15, it could be dues. We don't know. Sure. Sure. But as often as Sammy Watkins is injured, we don't know if Christian Watson is going to be a thing. Robert Tunyon is still out or still rehabbing from his ACL tear. Mm -hmm. It could just be Aaron Jones and AJ Dillon just running go routes. Like we don't even know like what that pass catching group is going to look like, but with, the Giants, assuming health and Kenny Galladay is on the field there in week one, we can at least squint and see what that pecking order is going to look like. And there are three legitimate options ahead of Wondell Robinson, Kenny Galladay, Kadarius Tony, and Saquon Barkley that we haven't even gotten into like the, the other guys. So yeah, it's kind of, it's difficult to see how Robinson makes a significant impact like in year one. And then we're, and again, like you brought it up beforehand, the massive gap between like the, the QB gap between the green Bay situation and what we've got in New York. So there are a ton of things that kind of have to break right for Robinson where it really doesn't have to for, for dudes. So of course, if anybody wants to come calling, like if I have Robinson on my team, anybody wants to come calling fine. 
And then, of course, also the size thing, too. Yeah, could he be this season's... Yeah, that's tough. Could he be this season's Tutu Atwell? Maybe. I mean, that's that's not that's not completely, like, out of the range of outcomes. It's good that they're talking more positively about him than what we heard about Tutu Atwell, than what we heard about, even though he's not small, I guess, relative to the rest of the receivers on his team. But could he be, like, this year's, like, D. Eskridge? Also possible. Well, yeah. But I mean, I mean, either way, yeah. It, so it's I mean, just his... it's it's difficult to. I mean, you're essentially walking walking a tight rope with him because given his size, given the offense that he's a part of, these things have to happen. Like these types of reports, we need to hear like those things about a guy like Wondell Robinson. Because if not, how quickly are they just going to churn the roster? Bring in, uh, I think they're they're not that strapped for cash, if I'm remembering correctly. So it's like they can bring in free agents mm -hmm. next year. They could draft. Well, I think it's less likely that they'll go ahead and draft another wide receiver with similar draft capital. But they could just dip into the later rounds, like four, like well, day three or something like that. The thing is that it's the most likely scenario is probably that he's a fine NFL player and fine value as a second round pick and not fantasy relevant um like yeah. you can still be a super productive player even if you ask sean mcbay about tutu atwell right now he would probably sing his praises oh he's because, still jazzed up about him because they the these coaches have a vision for guys like tutu atwell and wandell robinson where they're they, i mean gosh when they don't care about fantasy this, but if, like if there's you, there's yeah, tactical course, right. i mean there's tactical value for those guys like in the right situation shoot probably even Pete Carroll's jazzed up about what D S Rich could be on the field well and i Sean was going to say Cliff still with the same Rondell thing for Tutu. Moore is, yeah, is Ron, thing. he's true and look don't fight me because i'm in the same page where i think Rondell Moore should be used way way more and way way different but yeah. i think that Cliff viewed Rondell Moore a lot like um D Dabo viewed uh, Wondell Robinson in that they had five plays where they're just like, I need that guy to run this play. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and that's very valuable for an NFL team. What if Could that be? play wins the Super Bowl? But I'm not playing fantasy in the Super Bowl. So I don't care, I don't care if Wondell Robinson's one play is right. what wins you a game. Uh, so that's what's tough because right now we have to parse through that and see what you can do if you've got Rondo Robinson on your Rondo Moore, Wandell Robinson. Robinson. You see what we did there? Yeah. You got to see what you can do if you have Wandell Robinson on your team because you don't want to miss out on capitalizing on like inadvertent training camp buzz. Mm -hmm. Um we really just need to mention like historic. So historic trends are very, very valuable in my opinion for rookie wide receivers and some positions in some cases, maybe it's not the top of the pecking order for things that you look at uh, for prospects, but historic trends are a big deal. So second round picks, he's got a decent shot of panning out. Right. But then you have to put into his um, height weight, his comparables are what probably nothing. Probably mm. somebody like in 1962 that I've never heard of. Yeah, uh, so it's hard to. He's draw climbing. A he's climbing a huge mountain. So I guess when you wrap up this conversation, it's awesome to hear that Wondell Robinson is producing. I, sure. I I like him. I think he's electric. But then you have to think, well, since I know that his rate hit rate is like next to zero, um, and he's getting all this camp buzz, maybe it's just time to try to like move him for a, a decent 20 well he was going in the second right so you probably don't want to just take a random 22 but could you get more than a 2023 second for him maybe i doubt it but i guess just to spin it to a pot like to a positive note let's say what's the i don't even want to say like 90th percentile outcome for him but let's say even like 70th percentile outcome or 60th percentile outcome for for him over the next let's say not just his rookie season but say over the next two years could he be there isaiah mckenzie just uh factoring in like the day ball connection well, but that's just the, point. the, the I mean, timeline, the timeline moves hasn't, up? but he hasn't even been valuable for fantasy yet i think he will that's isaiah what i'm saying McKenzie, that you move he, he the, might you move the year, timeline but... up though and he becomes essentially what the bills are going to use McKenzie for this for year. this year. Yeah. Which is, just, yeah. Probably yeah. what Rondell Moore will do too, uh, yeah. which would be nice. Like let's start, 
let's start Wondell Robinson out off on that foot. Um, yeah, that would be he, great. He and gets then, like limited usage, maybe some gadget stuff or whatever, since it is Brian Dayball. So we, yeah, get a, right. we get glimpses of what he could be like in year one. And then in year two, they just kind of just, you know, hit turbo, especially after they draft a new quarterback. And then we actually see him develop into more of a wide receiver and our legitimate receiving option. But we get, let's say, McKenzie 2021 is going to be robinson's 2022 like that's sure. kind of what i'm thinking that could be like you know the 60th percentile outcome for him and then afterwards yeah. they continue to build on it in year two and they're not even holding back they already showed in camp what was it a uh, was a direct snap to Kadarius stoney no um ah, i missed it no i didn't see it that. was no i think it was a direct snap to saquon who handed it or pitched it to Kadarius tony but either way it was sure. a Kadarius tony bomb to wandall robinson for a touchdown all right. um, so that's that's pretty sweet, and that gets people excited. Now, let me – devil's advocate screaming in my ear again. Everyone's just saying, well, let's just trade every rookie that does good in training camp then, Adam. No, that's not what I'm saying at all. The, it just so happens that the two examples that we have are a fourth-round wide receiver, hard-to-hit fourth-round wide receiver. Amon Ra- St. Brown did it last year. Yeah, how mm-hmm. often did it happen before that? So go back and look at that, see what the hit rate for fourth round wide receivers is. And then, no, I'm not saying just trade Wandell Robinson because it's positive news. I'm saying he's got Mount Everest to climb because of his size and the comps for his size in NFL history. So if you can profit on Wandell Robinson's value before even having to worry about if he's going to make it to the top of Mount Everest based on his historical comps, then you just take a profit on them. I'm not saying to sell Christian Watson. You go trade for Christian Watson right now because he has the little Q next to his name in the draft board. So nobody wants to draft Christian Watson right now. Well, Mm -hmm. when the dust all settles and Christian Watson's healthy again, we're probably right back to having the conversation about Christian Watson being the wide receiver one for the Green Bay Packers. Why is that? Because they drafted him in the second round. That's why that's going to be. It wasn't that long ago that the draft happened. It just so happened that Christian Watson's banged up right now. So the news cycle is reflecting how uh, Romeo Dubes has been impressing. Well, he's impressing because he was a fourth round pick. So, I mean, probably best to just capitalize on the news as much as possible because a lot of it's hype, right? So we've got one more bit of news that we need to get to, and this one's going to be kind of tough to parse through. I'm excited for this conversation because I don't really know what to do with him either. Matthew Stafford is dealing with uh, a case of tennis elbow. Um, I guess it's like tennis elbow and throwing elbow. I don't really know what they're calling it. But uh-huh. it, but I the, the conversation I heard was more so comparing it to something like tendonitis where it's never going to get better. It's going to get managed. I'm not a doctor, so I'm not going to be able to go through that, but I will – parse through the conversation of people who are smarter than me who have said that it's not going to get better, but they can manage it. I know that Matthew Stafford is a tough SOB. Sorry, Joe. And I know that he's probably going to play pretty well because he hasn't been throwing much, but when he has been throwing, he's looked fantastic. Um, he, he's looked like there's nothing wrong with him. So let's hope that the best doctors in the world can keep Matthew Stafford on track, keep his elbow right, Um, and hopefully he doesn't miss any games. But what I'm gathering is that if he does play, he's going to play quite well. So what does that mean for you in Dynasty if if all that tends to be true? Then you just treat it as noise as of right now, and then you just ignore it. If you got him on your roster, cool. I mean, there's always going to be the chance of – I mean, well, heck, just look at the people that have Lamar on their rosters last year. I mean, chances of a quarterback getting sick or uh, chances of a quarterback getting injured yeah. are fairly equal across the board. I mean, if you want to have the argument about like rushing QBs that possibly get injured more, even though that's been debunked thoroughly, you can have that conversation. But still, I mean, the chances of him like getting injured are just as much as the others. And actually, this is an injury that he sustained before the start of last year when he came to L.A. Yeah, he's had it. Yep. He's had it. And just it was the hope that he would get over it or would get better. And it didn't. And the team had a management plan for him, and he wound up winning the Super Bowl. <laughs> right. Much and not to, just winning the Super Bowl, but supporting one of the best wide receiver seasons ever. Yeah, much to my chagrin. So it's just, again, it you can treat it as noise. I mean, unless you're, again, from the reports that we've heard so far, there's really nothing like a massive concern. But 
I think if you're in redraft leagues or like, or not even redraft leagues, but especially if you're on the dynasty end of things and you're having to manage it on a weekly basis. So if you're in those types of leagues, sure. Trying to lean into securing, let's say a better third option, like on your team. Cause my assumption is you have, you're rolling with at least three like quarterbacks. Like if you have, you're in a managed dynasty league, if you want to try, try and make a move for an upgrade at your QB three. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, even if you want to tack on like a fourth quarterback or something along those lines, like on the cheap. Okay, sure. You can do that as well. But moving, I think moving Stafford is a bit premature at this point, just based off of what we know, because there's yeah, no, you already have not, to sell for cheaper. Right. Cause the team still has John Wolford as their backup. So if they had yeah. coaxed Ryan Fitzpatrick out of retirement or made a move to acquire the losing duo of Geno Smith and Drew Locke, uh, or they moved to pick up Jimmy Garoppolo. Okay, now our alarm bells are going off in my head, and we need to have a much, much more in depth discussion. None of that's happened as of right now. So, if the team is not, I mean, teams can only, I mean, teams can't lie with their wallets. As most folks on the on this particular channel, the football guys like podcasting channel has said numerous times, teams can't lie with their wallets and they haven't told us anything with their wallets yet. The only thing that they told us is that Matthew Stafford's dealing with an elbow injury that he had from last year. So as of right now, I'm not doing much of anything other than just paying attention and making sure that it's not going to be something that we're going to have to monitor, let's say, every week. I mean, most folks will be on Stafford watch, like, quote unquote, like throughout the week anyway, and they'll probably have what that Q tag on like on Wednesday yeah. and it'll right. probably be gone by Friday or Saturday. At least mm -hmm. that's my guess based off right, of what right, we right. know, but the chances of him missing games, games, uh, plural, not on the table as of right now. So at least as of right now, I'm not right. trying to at least overreact to something that at least the team knew over a year ago. I guess the closing point to stick with the trend is just it's probably it, since it's been a, a buy or sell episode, it's probably buy into Matthew Stafford right now because um, there are going to be people who have Matthew Stafford in their two to three year plans that get weary and, and start considering him as a as a one year option yeah. um, that does not fit into the criteria of their builds anymore uh, because they're worried about that arthritis. I mean, we saw what in it, it's sorry, I, it's not arthritis. It's like arthritis. Um so they're worried about that long-term sustaining injury and they're going to want to find other options, um, maybe trade for a Daniel Jones or something like that. Granted, Daniel Jones will be with another team, still a young quarterback, probably going to get another starting gig somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so probably a situation where you could take one of those, like you said, actually, you probably spin your third option into someone that could be your first option. If you've got a young third option, if you've yeah. got a young guy that's got some upside, um, you could turn him into Matthew Stafford with not much in addition. Like, go find the guy that has like Carson Wentz on the back end of their roster with all of the like yikes reports that we've been hearing out of Washington training camp. Mm -hmm. See what you can do for that and maybe upgrade your third quarterback so that should Stafford have to miss a game, at least you then have a starting option. That might, yeah. That's probably going to cost you a little bit. That's a good point but, too. But again, it's just looking for ways that you can improve your roster without having to move Stafford. Absolutely. All right. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, please like, subscribe, rate, review. Uh, that's going to help us grow and then allow us to provide a lot more content going into the 2022 season. And we will catch you all next time. Peace.